So we're thinking today, part of our series about saints, uh, about Teresa of Avila. And hi, for those that I don't know who don't know me, you seem to be sitting over there. Hi, I'm Ruth. I'm one of the, the team, but you don't often see me at St. Bride's, but it's great to be here today, because uh, I'm usually at St. Michael's. Ah, Teresa of Avila, uh, you'll see her dates, except there is one mistake. I, I hold my hands up here. Mea culpa, mea culpa. It's actually 1515, not 35. She was born in 1515. So 500 years ago this year, Teresa was born in 16th century Spain. And uh, she was the favoured daughter of a noble family. It sounds like the beginning of a fairy story, doesn't it? There was this favourite daughter of this noble family who was pretty, attractive, charming, sparkly-eyed, glossy black hair, and her father loved her very much. That she was part of a family that had a bit of a, a, a bit of a disgraceful background. If you went back a couple of generations, you went, oh, actually, they're Jewish. Oh, which, of course, in Spain at that time was shock horror because they were, in fact, um, ejecting a lot of Jewish people. So a lot converted to Catholicism, her family included, after parading through the street in a yellow jacket and paying heaven knows how much of a fine, I might add. But they were extremely proud of their lineage and they looked forward, her father looked forward to making Doña Teresa a, a splendid marriage but instead she ran away not to join a circus but to join a convent in fact she'd run away some years earlier with her younger brother um, they'd wanted to go off and fight the moors in other words join the crusades i think they got as far as the town gate before somebody found them and brought them back but uh, like a lot of children, she, at that time, she had a great devotion to God and dreamt of being a nun. But actually, she thoroughly enjoyed her life uh, with her friends and relations. She enjoyed the jewellery. She enjoyed the dresses. But actually, when she was 15 and the time came for her father to find her a husband, she actually was ill. And uh, she went and stayed out in the country, away from the city of Avila, uh, went and stayed out with an uncle who himself had just been waiting for his children to grow up before he could become a monk and join a monastery. And he lent her a lot of books, some books. And because she was a well brought up young lady, she'd learned to read, unlike many other women in those days. And so she read some of these books and she thought for herself. And she determined to join a convent. She spoke to her father about it. Her father went, no, nah, not at all. Uh, and so she ran away. Uh, went to a convent, uh, the Incarnation in Avila, where her, a friend of hers was already uh, a novice and um, made her vows there. And, uh, and so it was a fait accompli. So her father basically had to say, oh, all right then, which he did in the end and became a great supporter of hers. <coughs> Um, she joined a Carmelite order. The Carmelites were originally a quite a strict enclosed order for women. They based their, um, their lineage, if you like, on go traced, traced it back through various strange means to Elijah on Mount Carmel and the whole idea of, of warfare, you know, with, with um, anything pagan. But certainly the focus on God and God alone is what you focus on. But by the 16th century, they'd become very lax. And because at that time, the only things that a, a wealthy, a well-to-do, well-brought-up woman could do was either get married and have a constant stream of children, just as uh, Doña Beatriz, uh, who is the, who was, uh, Teresa's mother, did and died young, and nine children who lived, um, or you entered a convent. That was it. There really wasn't anything else for you. So there were an awful lot of people living in the convent, a lot of women, for whom convent life was not really what they had wanted for themselves. It was just a better alternative, they felt, and a respectable alternative 
to, um, to marriage. And it wasn't a money thing because their father still had to provide a dowry for them to enter the convent, quite a large one, I can add. But basically, they had a lot of visitors, the place became a bit like a hotel, and although they, there was meant to be a screen, there was a screen between uh, the visitor and the nun, actually it was a tiny thing and, and you could kind of look round it if you really wanted to. And a lot of the nuns actually lived outside the convent, um, they uh, stayed with friends and relations, went on extended journeys. So it was very worldly living. But Teresa joined this monastery and this illness that she'd had at the age of about 15 dogged her throughout her life. Nobody really knows what it was. Might have been malaria, who knows? Um, there's some speculation as to, as to what it was. But some of it, no doubt, was brought on by the strictness with which she personally applied the rules of the convent. So although she was living in this place of, of quite lax discipline, she herself wanted a strictness of discipline. She wanted to focus on God. And part of that meant that she continued her spiritual reading. And she fell under the influence of various spiritual writers who talked about the path of prayer towards union with God. And this was something she wanted to seek out for herself. And there was a uh, the, the, the sisters were free to choose their own spiritual guides and she chose a man called Peter of Alcantara who was a Franciscan friar and you learnt about the Franciscans last week and their vows of poverty uh, and their really countercultural take on the Christian journey. And so she was heavily influenced by the Franciscans and she set out determined to bring the whole Carmelite order, not just herself, but the entire order back to its original vows of enclosure, of poverty, the renunciation of, of any property uh, and harsh physical discipline. And she gradually got sufficient other women in, involved in this that, to cut a very long story short, she could start her own small convent, uh, little convent in Toledo. And, um, it started with 20 sisters in a rented house and they had nothing, they had nothing at all. And so their day would be filled with saying the, the daily offices, the, the monastic hours, with private prayer, with work and with this personal self-examination which was a huge part of Teresa's own um, spiritual journey in which she encouraged in all her sisters. And she wrote um, a number of books, one of which was the constitutions of, of her reformed Carmelite order. And the punishments for the slightest sin were absolutely draconian. But apparently she never used to apply these. She, she would always kind of, to her sister, she applied them to herself. Apparently there's a story of her one day because she felt she'd done something, I don't even know what. But she, she saddled herself like a mule and was crawling around uh, during, during the, uh, the meal time, uh, you know, as, as if she was a beast of burden because she felt she'd committed some sin and the, and the sisters were all going, what? <laughs> as you can imagine. So she did go to some extremes. But the big thing about the reformed sisters was that they renounced property and they went back to the strict enclosure, although they did still go outside, they, they needed to make and sell things. They believed in work, so they were never without either sewing or spinning or weaving, some sort of work. And there are many, many accounts of um, Teresa when she would uh, have visitors speak to people. Um, no matter their social station, she would be spinning. And in fact, there's an account of one of her visitors, uh, quite an important bishop, who actually gave her arms to stop spinning because he couldn't stand the constant buzz of the noise of the spinning wheel. It was doing his head in, obviously. So, the other thing they did, and the reason I have no shoes on today, is that they were shoeless sisters. As a sign of their humility, they took off the shoes. And whenever possible, they walked about barefoot. And they still do today. I used to go on... Um, 
retreat with some Carmelite sisters in North London and they'd be wearing the full habit, quite a thick thing even in the summer and then you get these little toes peeking out the bottom, it's pretty cute. I, I guess you just get used to being barefoot, it's just something you do. So they were known as the, the discalced, which just means you've taken your shoes off. Um, but there were huge, huge rows between the, the traditional sisters, the ones with shoes, and the ones without. And there was a great deal of, um, well, originally bad feeling, because it was felt that Teresa, because she was of the class that she was, she was taking away some of the funding, the rich patronesses who might have funded the traditional convents were funding her. And can I say that she and her sisters lamented when people gave them lots of money because they said, oh no, we've lost poverty, how can we give it away? Fantastic. And in fact, she was, she was delated, the, uh, the official word is, to the Spanish Inquisition. No one expects a Spanish Inquisition, except, of course, they did in those days. Those were the, one of the heydays of the Spanish Inquisition. Don't forget, this was the time of the, the, the flourishing of Lutheran Protestantism and the fight back of the Catholic Church. So the, the Spanish Inquisition was there to make sure that right doctrine was being taught and anything which smacked of great enthusiasm and personal access to the Holy Spirit was regarded as highly dangerous. So Teresa and her nuns were delated, uh, denounced to the Inquisition and um, she spent three years under this denunciation. But Teresa being Teresa and a very worldly woman, worldly wise woman should we say, uh, wrote to the King of Spain and the Pope and quite a lot of other people and uh, in the end the King of Spain gave her the permission to set up this, this convent. The argument was that she hadn't had proper permissions and the Pope gave her a special order to say yes it could be founded. So you had the reformed Carmelites became an official um, what can you say, denomination almost, an official strand within the Carmelite family. But she doesn't immediately, Teresa, say, oh wow, fantastic, I can do what I like. She actually spends the first five years in seclusion writing. And what she writes is first her autobiography about her own spiritual journey and then the interior castle, which is this great work of, of mystical um, understanding of the path through the seven stages or dwelling places as she calls them towards union with God. And you've got this little quote here that uh, Jan read to us um, about spiritual marriage, which is uh, one of the stages, not the final stage I may say, but I love this idea that union with God, whereas with Paul you've got this idea of the fullness of God fills you, Teresa uses that also, um, but in her idea you go further than just this sense of the fullness of God filling you, the fullness of Christ, whereas you and God become indistinguishable as the stream entering the sea. And that is, I think, what has made Teresa one of the, the great mystical writers, is this, this vision of union with God and her ability to be articulate and to explain it to others from her own perspective. We know from her autobiography that this is not just as many other books of uh, spiritual journeying were at that time. It's not just a theoretical thing. This is personal experience. She is writing because she has been there. She is sharing with us that experience. And if you want to know more, tonight at the well at 6.30, we shall be looking more into the interior castle. For the rest of her life, she traveled widely through Spain, setting up 20-something convents and um, a couple of houses for men as well, because they also saw this and wanted to... Um, wanted to follow in this same idea of poverty and everything for God. And one of Teresa's poems, which you'll see there, uh, which is also a Teze chant, which we might have sung except it's not in the book. <laughs> let nothing upset you, let nothing startle you, all things pass, God does not change. 
patience wins all it seeks. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone is enough. And this was her watchword throughout her journeys uh, and her arguments, and there were many with authorities. God alone is enough. In fact, she died on a journey through Burgos in Spain to establish another convent. The lovely thing about Teresa is that she encountered a lot of opposition, but she treated it with great humour and great kindness and charm. There's a story that when she went to, uh, to visit one bishop, uh, he refused to see her. He, he, they kind of made an appointment. He refused to see her and said, no, you can just wait outside until I've got time. And, um, and she sent a message back saying to the effect, thank you so much, Bishop, for, your, for the opportunity you've given me for obedience. And in such lovely weather too. It was pouring with rain. In the middle of a storm, she sends this. And uh, another story when she, she goes... Um, on a journey to visit some nuns who she wants to persuade to change their, um, their way of life into, into a reformed way of life. And uh, the roads are muddy, she's covered in mud and uh, lifts her hands up, to, uh, eyes up to heaven and says, Jesus, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you had so many enemies. <laughs> she had a lot of humour. And said at one point, one of her great quotes from her is, God save us from gloomy saints. <laughs> I completely agree with that. I think that's completely lovely. But I think you, uh, there are two things really that fascinate me about Teresa. Well, there's lots of things really, but two particular things to identify. One was that she identified her, um, she identified in her time the obsession in Spain, um, in, in their society, their obsession with social status, with honour. It was an honour and shame culture. And um, she sought to counter that with her extreme humility and obedience. It wasn't done for its own sake. It was because it was making a stand against this obsession with honour and position which Spain had at the time, and her own family did. Um, hence the lack of possessions, the shoelessness, um, and their, you know, their constant filling of the time, no idleness. But although they were working, Teresa was saying, don't do anything too complicated. So do sewing, but it must be plain sewing, not embroidery. Nothing that would take your concentration away with God. So manual, repetitive tasks was what she asked her sisters to do. What a life. But it was all done as a counter to this obsession with honour. And against this, the other thing that fascinates me about Teresa is that against this harshness of discipline, which included weekly flagellation, in other words, beating yourself at the services, um, go figure, um, but against this harshness, her soul was free to fly. That's what I love about it. In the interior castle, her great work of the, the spiritual the life, the ascent of the soul, um, there is this concentration on private prayer as opposed to the public prayers which were so important to the Catholic Church at the time. Her experience of God is of the inward journey. In her autobiography, as opposed to, to the interior castle that we'll look at tonight, which uh, it, it has sort of seven resting places, she identified four stages of her own um, spiritual journey. From mental prayer, and I will quote here, which is of concentration, devout concentration of God, on God, and particularly, you know, things like the Ignatian way of contemplating the, uh, the passion of Christ, you know, imagining, visualizing the passion of Christ, for instance. Then there's, secondly, there's the prayer of quiet. When 
you stop visualizing and you simply dwell in this um, time of quiet in kind of in conversation with God speaking to God as you would a friend and then secondly the thirdly rather devotion of union which is almost an ecstatic state where you get this sense as you do in that reading we had about this sense of, of merging one with another and then the first the, th the final is the devotion of ecstasy or rapture where people said they saw her levitate during mass they said they observed her in a trance like state that makes you think of a lot of the eastern religions isn't it where people are said to achieve these kinds of trance like states where you have a complete out of body experience and that was her fourth state or the fourth state that she certainly experienced but anyway that's far too much from me um, what I suggest we do is just spend a few minutes just thinking together about maybe a couple of questions either or both this this idea of contemplative prayer this being set apart we don't do it the same way today or well, most of us don't there are still some Carmelites around and they are lovely smiley women I can tell you but this desire for union with God is this something you've ever experienced is this something you are a bit suspicious about people were in those days people may be today so what value is that seeking after union with God? Is this just something for ourselves? Does it change us in some way that, to make us more the people of God, the way God wants us to be? Or maybe to focus on our own society. The besetting sin, the besetting um, barrier between Spanish society in the 16th century and God that uh, Teresa identified was this idea of honour and position, social standing. So what's the prevailing attitude of our age that we might want to stand counter to and how as a church or as people of God might we do that? So two things, do you see a value in this personal pursuit of this union with God an intensely interior um, move, experience? And again on, on the outward shift, what what do you see as the prevailing attitude of the world that we might want to stand against? Discuss for the next few minutes. <laughs> now in twos, threes, large groups, do turn your chairs around and have a, have a think about what is it, or indeed anything else in Teresa's life that has made you think. <laughs>